The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, a Lucian Freud special. We hear about the exhibition at the National Gallery in London, a new book of the artist's letters and his love of horses. A host of new exhibitions of the work of Lucian Freud is opening across London to mark his centenary, exploring everything from his relationship with family and artist friends to his paintings of plants and horses, his etchings and his life in the studio. So this episode is all about this leading figure in British post-war painting. I take a tour of the major show at the National Gallery, which promises new perspectives on Freud's work with its curator, Daniel Herman. Then I talk to Martin Gayford about Freud's until now little explored letters gathered in a new book called Love Lucian and for this episode's work of the week I discuss the painting Mare Eating Hay from 2006 with the gallerist Pilar Ordovas who worked closely with Freud in his later years. The painting's in Ordovas's new exhibition Horses and Freud. Before all that, you can still take advantage of our latest subscription offer. If you have a friend or family member who's going to study art, art history or another subject this year, why not buy them a gift student subscription to the art newspaper from just £25 a year? Visit our website, click subscriptions and select student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast and our sister podcast, A Brush With, wherever you're listening. Now, the biggest of the cluster of Lucian Freud exhibitions in London this autumn is a major survey at the National Gallery, Lucian Freud New Perspectives, which opens this weekend. It features over 60 paintings from his early folkish experiments to some of the very last works he made before his death in 2011. I went to the National to talk to Daniel Herman, the curator of the exhibition. Daniel, the show is called Lucian Freud New Perspectives. What do you mean by New Perspectives? Well, our show is actually curated for and on the occasion of the 100th birthday of Lucian Freud. And we felt that at that moment of 10, almost 11 years um, after the artist's death, it's actually a good time to take stock of why are these works interesting? Are they still interesting? How do Lucian Freud's artworks operate? And by doing that, we felt that there was a awful amount of interest in his biography and an awful amount of interest in his life and that's all really important and and, and really good but a lot of stuff had been said about that and we wanted to do something different we wanted to in one way look at other approaches to an artist that can be there besides biography but we also wanted to kick the tires a bit of some of the common received wisdom about Freud and the stories that are always being told and we wanted to do that slightly differently. Um, I hope we we have succeeded in some of that. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about that sort of received wisdom about Freud? What do you mean by that? Uh, Well, so the first thing when I came to Freud and I actually didn't know much about Freud before I started researching this show about five years ago, but it was fascinating to see that there's a real storytelling about Freud that essentially reads like like a screenplay and it very much follows very established tropes and stories about artists. The way we talk about artists and artists' lives has been established since probably Vasari and his lives of the artists and the I don't know, 16th century. And already in, you know, I was reading parallel Chris and Kurtz's Lives and Myth of the Artists. And that was written or translated into English in 1937. But at the same time, you could see how the narratives about Freud hadn't really changed much. So I wanted to see, okay, how can we talk about Freud without the story of the a hero's journey where somebody leaves the family and becomes this reluctant hero that has to fight travails then uh, you know be criticized and have a rough time until they get rediscovered and then uh, ascend to the firmament of art we wanted to do that differently one of the things that's interesting of course is that much of the language around freud relates to the, this history of the school of london and his associations with a group of artists in london in the sort of uh, particularly in the sort of 40s 50s and so on that continues and then therefore a lot of the voices around that are consistent and and therefore the way that his work gets talked about is very much within the kind of 
language that has always been talked about with those artists. And a kind of language that he himself controlled very much as well. Lucien Freud was very, very keen on, on feeding information in particular ways, on editing information in particular ways. And I think that that has been very well explored in the excellent biographical work that has been done in the past by such fantastic writers as Bill Fever, for instance, who, who explored the biography there is in really rich ways. So I think that, that comes through that Freud also wanted to edit that, as many artists do. We now have an opportunity to actually um, look beyond those edits and perhaps have as an institution that comes from a historical perspective and also brings a certain art historical methodology to it that is rooted in a painting tradition and in a a critical assessment of painting tradition since the 15th century, um, or even longer if you want. We wanted to bring that to the table and try that. What happens if we apply that to an artist like Freud? And of course, that's because we're here in the National Gallery. And, and, and Freud came here. He was one of those lucky artists who could come here. Is it right that they could come in at any time of day? Basically? Well, he, he had uh, what my director calls a privilege pass and some other artists call a golden ticket. So he was actually able to come at any time of day and, uh, that he wanted. By the way, those tickets do no longer exist. I'm very sorry. <laughs> but he, he did come at every time of day or night as he wanted. And he would really spend a lot of time in the National Gallery. The interesting thing thing is that now Freud of course is an immigrant and very often part of the story that does not get told because he I think didn't necessarily want to talk about it he, he fled Germany you know he came from a wealthy background he came from an upper middle class but his family was Jewish and they were fleeing in 1933 the persecution to come from the Nazi party and the, the, the Nazi culture of Germany at the time so they were well off and they had it much easier than others but part of his families were murdered in the destruction camps and uh, Freud, as a 10-year-old, 11-year-old boy, fled to London. He was received here uh, with, with uh, great welcome by the British people and uh, made his home in Britain. He identified as British. But within his quite eventful life, the one constant that he always had was the National Gallery. And that was one of the reasons why we wanted to do this show here, because he had this relationship with the National Gallery for, for a long, long time. And even more so than we actually initially expected, because we know he came here on a regular basis. But as we found out through some archive work, he even grew up with the National Gallery. His father was an architect. He lived in Berlin. And for the first 10 years of his life, he actually uh, lived in the Regentenstraße in what it was uh, in, in Berlin. And in the living room of his parents' flat, there was a reproduction of Titian's Bacchus and Ariadne the very painting here at the National Gallery that he would still later interact with. That's extraordinary. And Titian was a, a great guide for him, somebody who he returned to again and again. He helped campaign to acquire the great poesie uh, that came into the collection and so on. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I, th I think Titian is a fantastic artist and he spoke about Titian a lot. I think he also looked at lots of other different artists in the National Gallery that he may perhaps didn't speak about that much. But when we look at the paintings and the way that he approaches compositional problems and looks for solutions. He looked for his predecessors. He looked for other people who knew about the craft of painting and had the skill of painters. And he looked for them here at the National Gallery. And we see that in a lot of the paintings. And there's this interesting quote that you use almost as like a preface for the show, which, where he says he comes to the National Gallery almost like a visit to the doctor. And he, that, he, That's he, what he calls he, it. Yeah, yeah, so he's sort of seeking out the sort of combinations of limbs uh, yes, in the painting yeah. so that he can learn directly and, from and, them. And it's interesting because he uses that, that medical analogy, of, which is based on observation. It's essentially, I come to the National Gallery as if it were a doctor looking for solutions to problems. So he, he comes at it with a quite analytical mind. He doesn't come to it to look for for the paintings themselves, he says, but he comes for solutions from the paintings. And this, this idea of the, the medical quote is something that we also try to pick up in the um, exhibition. We, we bookend the show with a quote by Hippocrates, the famous Greek physician, of course, where we mentioned this trope of art and life being conflated. Art is long, life is short, which is a quote by Hippocrates. But we think that that is a kind of ethics and a kind of look at painting and at life that Freud subscribed to. 
let's start talking about some paintings because we're in the room it's actually my favorite room in the show and it's the early work where he'd kind of got into his stride so we there's there's a bit of earlier work here which is sort of folkish and 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 you know really experimental and very influenced by some of his teachers at that time like Cecil Collins and so on but here we are surrounded by this this extraordinary very smooth painted style of his early sort of mature work if you like tell us about this I mean let's go over here because there's a girl with roses which I think is really instructive in terms of what you're talking about about that German history because I find it impossible to look at this picture and not think about the northern renaissance oh absolutely I, I completely agree and Freud actually actively distanced himself from any kind of lineage that would lead back to the country that expelled him essentially or that he had to flee so he, he didn't want to be seen in the tradition of the northern renaissance with its polyfocal approach to painting which would pay equal attention to every single detail of the figure that was represented and the scene that was shown and that is exactly what we see here in, in Girl with Roses. We see, first of all, a hugely bold painting because it's a big one. It's a, it's a really large size. It's about, I think, 120 centimeters high, maybe 78 centimeters wide. And it was exhibited at Venice Biennial in the 1950s. So there's a couple of things that I think that tells us. First of all, even when he was only, I believe, 25 years old, he painted bold. Secondly, he was immediately international. He was being shown at the Venice Biennial, and he was not just a British artist, he was an international artist. And then finally, we see by the way that this is painted and that the painter decided to paint it, that he puts himself into a lineage with old master painting, in this case, the Northern Renaissance. I completely agree. But we can also see, I think, that he's almost trying to deliberately erase any trace of making at this phase of his career. He's almost trying to deliberately um, eliminate any fingerprints, any momentum, any hand of the artist that would point at the work's own artifice. And that changes quite quickly after this. Well, let's go and have a look at some examples of how it, it changes. Now, we're leaping forward quite a few decades here, but that's something that happens in the show, isn't it? So you have the first two rooms which feel very chronological, but then you begin introducing themes where pictures from the 60s and the 80s, for instance, might, might mix yes. up. We, we did not want to have a catalogue resume on the wall. That's a great book, but that doesn't make a good exhibition. Uh, what we wanted to do is have a general chronology that goes from the early work to the uh, late work, spanning 70 years. But then within the chronology, we have groups that are thematic, in which we want to talk about topics that we felt were important for the understanding and a new understanding, a different understanding of Freud's work. So right now we are in a section that's called Art and the Studio, and it's roughly um, the 1980s onward. But by now, Freud's style of painting has definitely changed. He no longer has these meticulously articulated thin layers of paint that where he tightly controls the application of the matter on the canvas and much rather we feel like he's really working with the impasto he's really working with the brush strokes he makes them visible and he uses them as an, as an artistic tool and he does so in this painting as well one of the things I'm really struck by when I look at these paintings is how incredibly worked the surfaces are. Yeah. And I'm really intrigued by this because one of the things that that quote about coming to the National Gallery as a doctor and looking at the pictures themselves and seeing all these revisions and, and reworkings and everything else is it introduces to me a sort of sense of maybe doubt in Freud. And we think of Freud as this incredibly confident, single-minded individual. Yeah. Is there doubt in these, do you think? I think, yes, there is. And I think what you're describing right now, you know, the, the way that he's often being described, it's the genius trope. It's this idea that if somebody comes completely flawless and just perfect, and I'm not talking about personal things, but in terms of skill, craft, and somebody comes fully formed into the world, and that's the genius trope we like to talk about. No, that's not the case with Freud. I think with Freud, first of all, I think he's an incredibly hard worker, and that is actually something we see, and that is also something we see in the way that he reworks and constantly remakes his surfaces. His painting famously took a long time. He did not complete something willy-nilly, but it was worked, reworked, erased, and done over and over again over several settings, sometimes taking months of time of a sitter to complete. And in that, I think there is a moment of self-doubt. There's a moment of self-questioning that we perhaps see more in his painting than in his descriptions of his own paintings. In the end, Freud was an artist, not a writer. So I think that that is important. What we see here is a painting called Painter and Model, 1986-87. It's an interior, and it's from a moment in Freud's life where the 
art studio became more and more interesting to him and more important to him, both in his personal life but also on the canvas. Um, the art studio becomes this stage set but also this character in narrative plays that he almost uh, sets in scene in the frame. And what we can see here is a corner of his studio, there's a sofa in it, and two characters, two figures are visible. On the left-hand side, we see the painter Celia Paul. She's clad in a, in a smock which is smeared with, um, with paint, with pigment, and it's clearly a sign of, uh, of, of action that has taken place. She has been painting, she's holding a brush, and then on the sofa, in repose, um, there is the artist, the filmmaker, and the writer uh, Angus Cook. He's naked, he's reclining on the, uh, on the sofa fairly comfortably, and then there's something else because there's something happening here. It's a narrative. Celia Paul, the artist, is barefoot and she's stepping on a tube of paint that is squishing out of its confinements onto the floor and we are catching her so it seems it's of course a contraption, it's of course a, a construct, a painting that's made, but it seems like we're catching her in this moment of action, of stepping onto the tube that creates paint on canvas. And I think there's a number of things that are fascinating about it. So on the one hand, it's not what I expected when I came to Freud, because he has so many paintings where female figures are passive. And here, there is a female figure that is clearly active. She is the active agent that makes things happen, that drives story and narrative on this canvas. And that, I thought, was really fascinating and counter to what I expected from Freud. Also, the male model, well, the model here that is passively shown in, in, in repose is the male model. So there's a certain flip of what I would have expected for a Freud painting that was just interesting to see. Of course, the scene is in the end created by a male painter who actually held the brush and controlled the whole thing that we see. But it was done so over the course of several months and in collaboration with both sitters, who would have had to come back for this scene over and over again, and every time actually say, yes, let's do this, and I'll stand like this again, I'll lay like this again, let's finish this painting. One of the things about this, and generally about your approach to the show, is you've introduced in the catalogue the writings of Linda Nochlin about Freud, a very controversial piece that she wrote in the early 90s, in which she challenged the kind of accepted narrative about Freud. And it's a piece which is quite well known, but it's actually sort of been largely erased from the official Freud narrative, if you like. It's, it's something which you, you don't find in, or at least you don't find properly explored in many other catalogues about him. Yeah, I think it's a really, really important piece. Linda Lachlan, famously, if a fantastic art historian, feminist uh, theoretician, and she uh, reviews a show of Freud at the Metropolitan Museum in, I believe, 1993. And it's hard hitting. She basically says, okay, there's a lot to love here. There's a lot of um, style. There's a lot of technical quality that's to be admired. But, and then she criticizes a lot of different things. And one of them is that she says, oh, why are these art historians, curators and museums fawning about Freud so much? Isn't it just that they're just looking for the successor of Picasso and Freud is the next best thing in his habitus in the way that he presents himself in the role of the great white male painter? That's Nochlin's criticism. And I think any criticism of the art system that we are part of is extremely healthy. And she has some really, really smart points. She also has a couple of things where I would say, well, I, I don't quite agree with that. Uh, so, for instance, she extrapolates from her criticism of the show to the entire oeuvre of Freud. And as a curator, that's where I, of course, say, well, you know, what we show on the wall is only ever a small part. And it cannot be a comprehensive overview. We just try to make some small points. So I've got to be more humble than claiming that any show could ever show the entire artist. Mm. So that's where I would disagree with Nochlin. But I also feel uh, it's important to talk about what he was criticized for, that what is the role of the male painter in portraiture? How do we deal with a structural setup in portraiture that usually posits the idea of an active maker and a passive sitter? And I use the terminology that we sometimes know from Laura Mulvey's uh, fantastic essays on the male gaze, which I think are really, really important in the relation to Freud. But for me, it was also interesting to see how Mulvey's 
understandings of, of the gaze and the development of her theory there is, of course, influenced by film and photography. And what we're looking at here is painting. So when I take a picture, it is literally the Bartesian punctum. It's the moment of pushing the, the shutter that makes the picture. And I realize there's more to it. Any photographers can please write in and you can forward <laughs> it to me. But one of the, the structural conditions of painting is that it takes time and space in a different way than photography. It takes a longer time to finish a painting, definitely for a painter like Freud. And again, it, it also includes this constant dialogue with the sitters, which is not just a one-way street. And at that point, Nochland's point needs to be complicated. And I, I agree with lots of her, and I find her criticisms very interesting and, and, and smart. But I think we need to look with more nuance at both Freud and at Nochland's criticisms as well. One of the ways that you have talked about him in this show is that, again, part of that genius myth, I guess, is that his eye is a cruel eye. And that's sort of that's almost sort of semi built into Nocklin's criticism as well. Yes, in the sense that, that you know there he is, you know, famously standing up, often looking at prone figures, reclining figures, and yes. so on. But one of the arguments in this show is is that there is an occasional tenderness that's detectable in his work. I think it's true, and it really surprised me. I do think there's an enormous amount of tenderness actually there that I didn't expect to find. So one example would have been in the 1980s another work that's called Two Men, which is in the collections of the National Galleries of Scotland. It shows two sitters, male sitters, on a mattress in the, the art studio. One is dressed, one is undressed. And Freud's work is very often looked at through the lens of eros. And of course, in a painting like that, you've got a naked figure, you have a dressed figure. There might be you know, some sexual promise or something that you might want to see in there. But more than anything, you see that there is a hand that's just resting on a calf. And that's it. And it's very tender and I find incredibly loving and very, very well observed. And Freud has that observation that um, I think adds nuances to intimacy that include eroticism, sex, but also go into familial relations. He has a wonderful way of painting two of his daughters laying together on a sofa as only sisters would in a way that is incredibly familiar and I find it incredibly touching. Maybe I'm just projecting my own happiness with family onto something that others would enjoy entirely differently, but that's what, what I see in it. Now, when we're coming to nudity, when we come to Nocklin, what I find fascinating is how the language of Freud has changed over the decades. As an art historian, I read a lot of stuff, so I've been looking my way through the art reviews from the 1950s to now, and in the 1980s, and especially in the 1990s, we all of a sudden encounter a lexicon of cruelty when it comes to describing Freud, where he's more and more described as having a cruel eye, an unforgiving eye, a dissecting eye. And this, in the majority of cases, the reviewers apply that language when describing not the paintings, but the sitters, and in particular, non-normative female bodies. And that's where we have this painting of sleeping by the lion carpet, for instance. That's a good example. It shows she was known then as the benefits supervisor, Sue Tilly, who is a writer and artist and, and all around interesting figure in, in her own right. And uh, she and the, the queer performer and performance artist, uh, Lee Bowery, worked a lot with Freud at the time. And they were both people who were, who were large, who had big bodies, big personalities. And Freud painted an amazing amount of, literally amount, large works uh, about these two sitters. And right now we're looking at one figure, Sutili, sitting in a chair. Her head is resting on her arm. Maybe she's dozing off. Maybe she's uh, resting her eyes. And we're looking at her body that's naked. And it's gorgeous. I, I do think it's a gorgeous painting. You can also say there's actually some flaws to it in some aspects. The drawing around the stomach, I find, sort of slightly yeah, problematic, I have to say. It's, sort of, it's just extraordinary, that sort of thing. He spent so much time trying to get this right. Yes. You almost feel like sometimes you just, there are some bits that are so clearly uh, like kind of overworked. Yes, you know? and sometimes I feel, I wonder if it's on purpose as well, that he always lives one piece de resistance that kind of catches your eye and you're like, wait right. a second. Is that something that, that should be done differently or could be done differently? I, but I know what you mean. What I love about this painting is that, again, this would have taken months to complete. So he lavished not just different layers of paint onto this canvas, but also attention onto the sitter and onto the painting itself. So in a way, 
it's a painting that required an enormous amount of care to finish. And that's where one of the fantastic essays and, and authors for our catalog really opened my eyes to this painting. Greg Salter is writing about the representation of queer and non-normative bodies in the 1980s and 90s in Britain, a time that was defined by Thatcherism, a time that was defined section by... 28, the, section, the, the 28, section 28. Section 28. It's civil basically a law sort of making it illegal to educate children about non-normative sexuality. Exactly. And a lot of the language in which Freud's work at the time is described, that we still use today, comes from that time. And it becomes very concerned with the regulation of unruly bodies, and especially female bodies. And very often they're being, I right now described it as a, as a big woman sitting on a chair, and I do think it's gorgeous, that's, that's honest. But then we also read a lot of reviews talking about the sitter in ways that are almost punitive. She was famously Big Sue, as she was known to all her friends. Lee Bowery knew her as Big Sue. That was what she was known as. She was famously insulted on television. Exactly. Uh, And and it was a sort of slip of the tongue from the presenter, but it was clearly about that presenter's own prejudices about Sue Tilly's body. Absolutely. And I do think we now would look and do look at these paintings differently. And I do think the language that was offered at that time was one of control, of wanting to control female bodies in strange ways. And I think now we would be more cognizant of that and we would probably do it differently. I definitely experience that difference from younger artists, from younger audiences, and definitely from women. Mm. So in, what you're saying then is that cruelty is in the eye of the beholder and there's a certain generosity about these kind of extraordinary... It was an extraordinary flowering, actually, in his career, wasn't it? The early 90s where, where Sue Tilly and Lee Bowery came in, there was these vast paintings on a real sort of grand manor scale that came in and this was a kind of great flourishing and, and a totally new attitude. Exactly, and they made for fantastic works of art. I have to be quite quite biased about that. That doesn't excuse any you know personal shortcomings of, of Freud the man and the the person that he might have been. But these artworks allow for a very different way of looking at the human body and um, appreciating and uh, and cherishing it that I think we do also need to acknowledge, if that makes sense. That's great. Should we lastly just talk about the man himself? We're standing in front of probably his most famous self-portrait, would you say? Yeah, this is probably the most famous self-portrait, and this is full frontal Freud here. We see a self-portrait naked. It's a full frontal portrait, and the artist is uh, in his 70s. And there's something strange happening. On the one hand, the background of the painting is really smoothly painted. The wall of the room and the studio that, that he's in is very smooth and quite evenly painted. The floorboards are very evenly and smoothly painted. But then there's also an enormous amount of accretion of paint that's happening to the point where it, it really becomes striking because it's so sculptural. And those moments are when Freud articulates paint on the surface of the body and on the surface of a palette which he's presenting to us. He's holding up a palette knife and he's showing us a palette with paint on it. And the paint is built up in this agglomerating way, just like the knobbly knees are built up, just like he paints his genitals in a way that they almost sculpturally poke out of the canvas. Same with his face, which was overpainted several times in 1993 when he made this painting for a fantastic show at the Whitechapel Gallery that uh, Catherine Lampert curated. We're standing right beneath the picture at the moment, and from this angle, I can barely distinguish his facial features. It's that heavily worked, isn't it? Correct, yes. And what I think Freud is doing is that he's making an analogy. I think he's making an analogy between skin, the surface of the body, and paint, the surface of the canvas. Those are the two areas that he treats in the same way. It's life and art, art and life, that he posits as an equivalent. And that's where I take on my uh, art history nerd hat and look also at the palette knife of this figure's hand. Because Freud never painted with a palette knife. Not once in his work can we see a palette knife. So why is it so prominent here? What's happening? Well, this is actually the position of a particular iconographic figure. It's actually St. Bartholomew the Apostle which has a prominent role in the Sistine Chapel in The Last Judgment. And this is, of course, a fresco by Michelangelo, who shows St. Bartholomew the Apostle with his instruments, his attributes of martyrdom, a flaying knife, and the flayed skin that was pulled off his own body while he was standing up for his beliefs. 
it's an extraordinary representation, unforgettable. Once you've seen it once, you will never, ever forget this representation. Will you? Exactly. And Freud would have known it. What Freud does, he doesn't show us a flaying knife, he holds up a palette knife. And he doesn't hold up his own skin, but he holds up a palette that is worked in the same way as his skin. So he's showing us his raw insides in a way. He's showing us his raw insides. He's doing it in the medium of painting, and it becomes this apotheosis of both the discipline of painting, the person of the painter who puts himself on the firmament of art history just like Michelangelo did. And it becomes this lineage of art theory, of painting theory, that goes all the way back to the Renaissance that would have thought about painting as a discipline that can transcend life itself even beyond death. Daniel, that's a very good place to end. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Lucian Freud, New Perspectives, is at the National Gallery in London from the 1st of October until the 2nd of January 2023. Coming up, Freud's letters and his late painting of a horse. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. Dozens of Ukrainian museums are set to be appropriated by Russia today as President Vladimir Putin plans to sign a decree annexing four occupied regions. Earlier this week, citizens in the territories of Donetsk, Luhansk, Kherson and Zaporizhia voted in so-called referendums on accession to the Russian Federation. The votes were overwhelmingly in favour of Russian control but have been described as shams by Ukraine and its allies. If the annexation goes ahead as expected, thousands of artefacts and heritage pieces in museums that are collectively owned by the Ukrainian government and its subsidiaries will be lost to the Russian occupiers. Sarah Doan, the exiled Kurdish artist and journalist, staged a protest performance at the Iranian embassy in Berlin on Monday following the death of Masa Amini in police custody in Tehran. Amini died after being detained by the Iranian regime's morality police for allegedly not complying with hijab regulations. Doan smeared the railings outside the embassy with a mixture comprised of henna, hair and menstrual blood. A spokesman said the action was intended to support the resistance of Iranian women. And finally, a man from Florida who set fire to what appears to be a Frida Kahlo drawing as part of an NFT launch is under investigation for federal crimes in Mexico. Martin Moborak, a Mexican technology entrepreneur and creator of the cryptocurrency AG coin, filmed his stunt on the 30th of July. It was part of his project Frida.NFT, which is minting 10,000 digital versions of Fantasmones Siniestros, a drawing by Kahlo. Footage on YouTube shows Moborak unveiling a work on paper that appears to be the drawing, unscrewing it from its frame and setting fire to it in a large martini glass to the sound of cheers and a mariachi band. The video caught the attention of Mexico's National Institute of Fine Arts and Literature, the country's leading cultural authority, which is investigating the destruction on the grounds that Carlos works are national treasures with legal protection. You can read all these stories and much more at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for Android or iOS, which you can get from Google Play or the App Store. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. This October, Christie's New York presents Classic Week. Artistic triumphs span centuries in three auctions featuring old master paintings and sculpture, important books and manuscripts from the library of Edward R. Leahy, and icons from the ancient world in the devoted classicists, the private collection of a New York antiquarian. Visit christies.com slash classicweek for more. Welcome back. Now, hot off the press this week is a new book, Love Lucian, which documents the letters sent by Lucian Freud from 1939 to 1954, so from his teenage years to his first flush of success on the international art scene in his early 30s. The book's edited by Freud's long-term assistant and director of the Lucian Freud archive, David Dawson, and by Martin Gayford, the author of another book on Freud, Man with a Blue Scarf, among many other titles. I spoke to Martin about Freud's newly unearthed correspondence. Martin, you've written books about Michelangelo and about Van Gogh, who are two of the great letter writers of art. Where does Lucian Freud sit next to them? 
Well, I'm inclined to think, and I hope the world will agree with me, that these are some of the most interesting and enthralling and uh, lively artists' letters to emerge since Vincent van Gogh's were published over a century ago. They're very different from Vincent van Gogh's, or indeed from Michelangelo's, but uh, I think they're a really good read and revealing and interesting too. Can you say in which ways they're revealing? Because one of the things that struck me looking through the book is that, it, you know, the wonderful way that Van Gogh minutely explains his compositions, that, you know, the detail that he goes into, into, into his paintings. Freud's letters aren't like that, are they? There's not a great deal about his work, or occasionally he lets drop a, a remark. And, oh, for example, he writes to uh, Kenneth Clark, who's a great patron, my senior of artists at the time, that, that he thinks his portrait of his first wife, Kitty, which has just been exhibited in a gallery in London, is the best thing he's ever done. And so that kind of thing is interesting. A big revelation of the letters, I think, is how important his relationship, his friendship with John Craxton was, which has been rather hidden before because they fell out. And consequently, Lucy in particular just got a bit edgy when Craxton's name was mentioned. He didn't talk about him a lot. In fact, he he tended to erase him from his memoirs. So insofar as up to now, a lot of what we have read and known about Lucian has depended on what he said happened in the 40s. This this really opens a door and you can see that uh, for several years there were two young artists who were working very close together, thinking on parallel lines, uh, mixing in the same circles and that's actually one of the richest parts I think of the correspondence and has only, only really appeared in the last couple of years. There's a lovely playfulness in the way that Freud writes to Craxton, isn't there? Because he calls him Craggy and Craxpino and all these funny little names. Tell us about that. And signs himself Looch and Splooch. Well, they were sharing, not a studio, but uh, had uh, studios on two different floors of the same house in North London for a while in the early 40s. And they had evolved some sort of private language, I think that's what Wittgenstein called them, which... I've talked to some surviving witnesses or auditors of their conversations when they were staying in a farm outside Cambridge in the early 40s. And these people who are now, who were children at the time, called the language Eggy Peggy. But they obviously, Freud and Craxton, were were capable of just going into a a level of discourse which not very many outsiders could could penetrate. And you see that in the letters. Some of them were quite hard to decode, actually. Yeah, very much so. And and actually, that's an interesting point, because you've had to write a lot around the letters in a way to kind of decode them, not just to Craxton, but to everybody, actually. Mm. Freud is, as you say in the introduction, he adopts different languages almost for every different person he's addressing the letters to, doesn't he? Well, that's right. And I think the uh, handwriting, to an extent, is different (laughs) to, to each person. I think that's probably, in itself, is quite a key to Lucian's personality. I think to an extent, all of us are different depending on who we're talking to. And I think Lucien probably it was extremely responsive to other people, which feeds into his lifelong preoccupation with portrait painting. He'd reflect what the sitters were interested in on their sensibilities, and that was part of the way he worked, really. How long have you known that you might have been able to do a book like this in the sense of, you know, um, have a lot of these letters come to light relatively recently or has it always been a stash of stuff that needed to be explored but perhaps only when Lucien was no longer with us could you really properly go into it? Well, they've emerged bit by bit. I think uh, mainly, possibly entirely since Lucien's death, which is only, what, 11 years ago now. When we set out, David Dawson, who was my co-editor and colleague on the project, and I, we knew all about the letters to Spender because even Spender, those had been sold at auction. We knew about uh, several other sets, but I would guess maybe 35, 40% of what's in this volume is new or we didn't know when we set out on it three years ago. We were making discoveries quite rapidly and regularly while we were working on it to the extent that I think the publisher started to worry that we might make too many discoveries and you know, the book might get completely out of hand because we were, we were adding new things almost to the point where the whole thing had to be sent off to the printers. I imagine quite a lot may, may turn up now actually as well. 
Yeah, indeed. I was thinking that. I guess one of the key aspects of it is that you've decided to reproduce the letters in facsimile, and that's because they're so visual. Yes, uh, yes, I think that's a, an unusual, maybe unique feature of uh, of a book of letters. We decided to treat them as visual objects, and I think that works in several ways. One is that quite a lot of them, particularly from the early 40s, have drawings incorporated into them, maybe sometimes just set into the text or at the bottom or underneath watercolours, collage. So many of them, one could easily argue, are works of art. But as I was saying earlier, all of them have that physical sense of Lucin adjusting how he writes the physical marks to the occasion, the person. There's a marvellous one of my favourites, although it's very short, in which he wrote to Craxton on paper from a hotel on the west coast of Ireland uh, in, I think it's uh, 48, saying that a lot of things have happened, but he's going to tell him about it another time, and it just ends too tired whiskey (laughs) and the handwriting is particularly not very neat for that one i'm sure the interesting thing about the visual characteristics of the letters is that they're very diverse you know they're not purely explanatory in terms of the like this is what my new painting looks like although there is a bit of that there's lots of funny little almost caricature elements aren't there yes well i think one thing you get very clearly from these which you don't always get from accounts of lucian is how charming and how funny he was which are both important clues to how he interacted with people and he was in conversation he was constantly going off in lateral directions and using words in unusual ways constructing very uh, very individual personalized metaphors and you see that in the lesser he sometimes does it visually he's playing around with words playing around with in a way with what a letter could be and there's a sort of coded communication with Craxton and several other people, Felicity Hellaby, who was, I think, probably a prospective girlfriend more than an actual girlfriend. He wrote wrote a lot, very different tone, more sort of chat-up tone than he writes to, uh, to Craxton. And uh, he and actually uh, Craxton and several of his friends obviously had huge files of interesting postcards and Lucian's choosing the most amusing or appropriate postcard, almost in the way that these days people use emojis to communicate. And Lorna Wishart, who was a first great love affair, she does the same thing, sending postcards from Bognor Regis, or the image is referring to Bognor Regis, which is near where she lived in the in the country, and uh, but adjusting them, so love from Bognor Regis and kisses going between two male and female heads and so on. So uh, there's a lot of visual communication going on. Indeed. And as well as the sort of humour, is there a certain level of vulnerability that we see to Freud here that, again, maybe has been slightly hidden? I'm thinking particularly in the case of there's a section where you reproduce not letters so much as notes that he's written in a kind of book yes. where he sounds very lovelorn. He, he sounds uh, destroyed by the end of their relationship. Yes, he obviously got into into a tremendous state of, about Lorna Wishart, and that that's always been known. But what we haven't seen up to now is any of their correspondence because she burned all the letters from not only Lucian but uh, her other lovers who included Laurie Lee who Lucian replaced uh, which is a shame for posterity and there are one or two letters and postcards from her in the Freud archive but they hadn't previously been identified because they're not signed or not very clearly signed so we've been able to reconstruct a bit of that correspondence and the tone of that relationship and certainly yeah Craxton's worried about him he's depressed his health seems to be suffering he was had some sort of intestinal disorder in 44 45 46 which might have been pancreatitis actually which he suffered from much later in life and it was said then it was maybe a recurrence and not only then he refers quite a bit later on having the blues or feeling down and yes that sense of being a little bit on an emotional up and down cycle that you wouldn't really have guessed that from his behavior in his 70s and 80s but obviously it was part of his constitution when he was younger 
The interesting thing for me is about how broadly he travels in this period. It's obviously a really tumultuous period for the world because you're dealing with the period of the Second World War. He's obviously making the journey from childhood to young adulthood. And so what you've also got is what quite a broad geographical spread of of places that were influential for him as well as the people in those places yes he's exploring the world that's right and particularly after the end of the second world war because in a way it was like for non-combatants it was like an extended lockdown everyone was stuck in britain and paris had always been the absolute center of the, the visual art world and nobody had been able to get to paris since 1939 and you feel this sort of pent-up determination to get across the channel by in hook or by crook. Craxton and Freud tried to get smuggled on a fishing boat from Cornwall in early in 45, but it, they were discovered by the Coast Guards. They finally end up in 46 in Paris, and there are some marvellous letters from both of them, actually, recounting the excitement of being there, seeing Picasso in the street, meeting Alexander Call, that uh, Lucien describes as enormously fat and looking like a, a mixture between W.C. Fields and a Weimar-era botanist, and saying all sorts of crazy things and making mad jokes, which was exactly the sort of thing Lucien would have liked. And, you know, he meets, has dinner with Giacometti, who Lucien says is charming, and he looks just like Harpo Marx. Actually, from about until 54, Lucien spent a lot of time in Paris. Not after that, but months on end. I mean, he's, he does quite a bit of work in Paris. Um, in 54, he ends up living with his second wife, Caroline Blackwood, in a hotel on the left bank and painting there. And also, what I think wasn't so true later on in his life, he's very attracted by the Mediterranean, or goes there. He goes to Greece, although Craxton's the pathfinder there. He has a couple of expeditions to the south of France, three, in fact. And I think what happened there is that after trying it out, he found that that strong Mediterranean light, which so appealed to Van Gogh and Matisse, wasn't for him. And actually, the other place he discovers during those years and in fact went back to probably more subsequently is Ireland. He once told me that his ideal climatic conditions were Dublin's high light cloud. (laughs) There was something about the way he worked which was really incompatible with strong sunlight directional light. You mentioned about Paris and you know, one of the things that strikes me reading those Paris letters is he's, he's almost giddy, isn't he? It's like a stream of consciousness of what he's seeing and experiencing yes. and feeling and everything else. Yeah, well, it must have been pretty... I mean, you can imagine he'd been uh, stuck in, in cold post-war London living on rations for years <laughs> and suddenly all this exciting social and artistic world opens up immediately. And food as well. They seem to tell me that, although I think he'd eaten in good restaurants in London and so forth, that his first experience of French food was absolutely revelatory. He had, he had no idea that food could be so delicious. And uh, there's a bit about that in the letters. And I think people wanted to know what had happened in Paris because the British art world were in the habit of looking to Paris to, to, to see you know, what came next. And essentially, there hadn't been any updates for seven years when, when he got to Paris, something like that. So there was quite a lot, actually, particularly in the letters to Craxton about what Picasso's been doing recently, what the new developments are. He goes to the third Surrealist exhibition, which is something which, an event which has now got slightly forgotten because Surrealism sort of slipped after the Second World War. But in 1947, people didn't know that. And Lucien was at that stage quite interested in Surrealism, although he never quite signed up to the movement. And there were attempts made to... Try, try and get him to become a conscript. But yeah, I think he was too much of an individualist. To... Yeah, absolutely. But you get that sense, don't you, from the letters that, you know, the, of the presence of Breton, even if there's not vast amounts of the, of the ideas of Breton or the kind of the surrealist language, if you like. There's just that sense of him as a sort of massive presence in that world. Yes, he's one of the people who was dining in this restaurant, which Freud and Craxton made a, a beeline for, which was just down the street from Picasso's studio. And Picasso had discovered it. And then 
the entire Parisian art world or the inner circles immediately started eating there. So you, you could see all of them sitting at tables. So obviously that would have been a very exciting thing for a young British painter in his early 20s then. Obviously, Lucian was quite a private person. He let very few people into his world to chronicle it. You were one of them. What do you think he'd have made of the letters being published? Well, I think Lucian would probably have been appalled by this revelation of his uh, his private communications. And both David and I thought about that reaction he would have had. But I think in the long run, it's the price you pay for fame. And when somebody is as important as Lucian has turned out to be in art history, then I think probably posterity is entitled to peer into as many corners as are available. I think probably quite a lot of the correspondence has gone and maybe Lucian destroyed some himself, but there is a substantial amount left, actually. And as I say, I have a feeling that more will turn up. Well, that's a good prompt for my final question, which is, of course... Is there going to be another volume? This goes up to the point where he's achieving quite a lot of fame before that fades, actually. Yes. Quite a long period in the wilderness follows this. But as you say, it wasn't purely that you had a lot of material and you had to stop. Surely there's a reason for stopping. There must be another volume in the works. Yes. I Well, we hope so. We'll have to start prospecting. I mean, I do know of a certain number of letters from the second half of the 50s. There are more to Sonia Orwell, for example, from 56, 57, that kind of time. But we haven't seriously started looking for those. But my guess is that, yes, there is scope for another volume for covering perhaps the next 25 years up to the 70s, something like that. And then you know, conceivably a third one. I think possibly the problem one runs into is that like the rest of um, the human race, Lucian was inclined to use the telephone more in, in later years. And 40s and 50s are probably just about the last era when people wrote long, long letters to each other rather than just you know, picking up the phone. Well, thank you, Marcy, for telling us about this amazing book. Great pleasure. Thank you, Ben. Love Lucian, The Letters of Lucian Freud, 1939 to 1954, is published by Thames and Hudson and priced £65 or $95. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. The show Horses and Freud is now open at the Ordovus Gallery in London, and the centrepiece of the show is a late painting, Mare Eating Hay, from 2006. I went to the gallery to talk to its owner, Pilar Ordovas, about the work. Pilar, we're in a room of Freud's works and related memorabilia, archival material, all about horses. Why? I have always been fascinated with his relationship with horses and the world of horses. From very early age until the end of his life, they formed a very big part of his life and his work. From being a child and riding to later on in his life, some of the later paintings he did were actually of horses. So I've also always been fascinated that it joins two very different worlds. All worlds collide through the love of the animal. Right. And one of the things I learned through the letters that I've been reading, which we've heard about on this podcast, is that from a very early age, horses and money <laughs> were connected for Lucien Floyd. Tell us about that, because he was a, a gambler right from his very early years, wasn't he? Uh, the distinction I would make is horses and risk. That is what was really important. So gambling and the risk of losing it all somehow equated to the risk in painting. So the more he was at the brink of that precipice made him push his painting on. So gambling was really useful when there wasn't so much money because they lose it all or have it all put him in that edge that made him do the best painting he could. Once money was no object, he was not interested in gambling anymore. So the last 20 years of his life, he didn't gamble anymore. In terms of that risk then, what did it give him as a painter? A, a kind of an anxiety? A kind of, where is that edge? What does that mean? <laughs> I think I always remember him talking about wanting to make the very best painting he could make all the time until the end of his life. So his ambition as a painter was 
as he was looking at that canvas, he would create yet again something where he would push his painting even further. That pushing, that feeling uncomfortable, that feeling on the brink of something is what gambling and that risk gave him. And when he stopped giving it to him, he stopped gambling. So I, for me, it's quite interesting to think about it in a slightly different terms to how we normally would think of gambling. You gamble because you might win or you might lose, but mainly because you hope to win. For him, it was almost more the being on the verge of losing it all that gave him that impetus to get his painting going. Extraordinary. Before we move on to what we're actually going to talk about as Work of the Week, you've actually included a painting of a bookmaker here. Tell us about that, because is it right that he would settle bets by painting people he owed money to? So one of the things that interested me looking at the subject of horses and the people in this world is obviously the sitters that came into his paintings through the world of horses. And they were very varied, from the Queen to many bookmakers to many friends that made introductions, like Michael Tree, who got him to meet Brigadier Andrew Parker Bowles, who took him to the Household Cavalry, where he could actually draw horses in the 80s, to bookmakers that Lucien would settle some of the debts by painting them. And we have one in this exhibition, and it's really interesting how some of these people became not just people that he gambled through, but they became very big collectors and friends and patrons of his work as well. I'm looking now at Mayor Eating Hay. He obviously didn't just love betting on horses. He seems to enjoy the very form of horses, and we're looking at a, a really bold means of putting that on canvas right in front of us. As I was saying before, I think that is what interested me. It wasn't just the betting, it wasn't just the gambling, it was the love of the animal. He was found sleeping in the stables when he was a student, a little boy, and he still loved the animal until the very end. This portrait of Meryton Hay, which is a portrait of a mare called Sue. Sue was actually at Lucien's funeral. And, um, we should say it's Sue, S-I-O-U-X, as, absolutely. as in Native American. And after painting her, there are two paintings of her, one which is at Chatsworth, and this portrait that you're looking at now. He continued to go and visit her and make donations towards um, the centre where she lived. So I have always been fascinated about his portraits of animals because to me, whether it's an animal or it's a person, he treated the work in the same way, with the same care and with the same precision in everything he was doing. So he would have gone to the stable. I know that David Dawson, in this case, would be holding the mare and he set up his studio, his easel, and he was painting the mare like he would paint another subject, day after day, mixing his colors in the canvas, which would give him more time and more information about the animal. I have actually spoken at length to many people that saw him handling horses, and one of them was Andrew Parker Bowles, who we've interviewed for our catalogue for this exhibition. And he said he had a real special ability with them. He was worried the first time he went to the Household Cavalry to ride and thought, you know, he's of a certain age, I'll better make sure that I give him a safe horse. And he just had a way with horses that made them comfortable and that he was comfortable. He didn't believe in trotting or walking. It was cantering or nothing. (laughs) Okay, that's interesting. The interesting thing for me about the way that Freud depicts animals, and I mean this about dogs too, is he almost seems slightly liberated when he's painting animals in a way that I've noted with Daniel earlier in the podcast about how Freud's insistence on trying to get the figure right seems to me to be quite an anxious process, where sometimes when he paints animals, he seems freer somehow. Would you agree? I'm not sure I would agree. I think what I would agree is that the freedom comes from the animal more than the person. So I think he's portraying who is in front of him. And as an animal, you are not conscious of how you're standing for the painter. So you are just yourself in the same way as a dog would be standing. Whereas I think as a sitter and as a person, you are obviously aware of yourself, aware of your movements, and you know, you're going on to your internal life and thoughts. The animal is just being themselves and not really caring about Lucian Freud painting them. Of course, yeah, yeah. This is particularly notable, this work, because the composition is pretty extraordinary in the sense that he hasn't attempted to establish the stable as a space in a particularly detailed way. He's gone right in, really zoomed in, and even parts of the horse are sort of creeping out of the frame, aren't they? 
Yes, and I think that's what makes it even more fascinating. So you do have the eye and the horse is very much present and very much there. But the other portrait of Sue is even more of a crop into the mare where you have no head, no eye. For me, what I like here is there is a sense of space, but you don't really see the stable. You just see that the mare is eating the hay and you have the hay all around. He has taken the same care as he would do with any figure to do the background. And I know that as he did with any sitter, even when he was painting the background, the mare would have had to be standing in position. And in terms of the way he's depicted the hay, it picks up on this, this sort of consistent element of lots of the works that he uses elements of the space to emphasise the paint itself and the kind of abstraction of paint. It's, it's in the spaces around the main subject that he can sort of be freer in terms of the way he uses the paint, right? I think it's also, as he went on later in life, we see the treatment of the brush strokes really change. So this work is from 2006 and we have it hanging next to two works from the 80s. And if you look closely, you would see the difference in the brush strokes and the treatment of the face and the fabrics and everything around it. So at this stage, his paint had become a lot freer. And actually, you can also see at the back of the mare how the surface becomes more and more fully worked and more fully impastered. So if you get very close to it, it's almost abstract. You have to get away from the subject to really get it more into focus. And that is something that I remember seeing in works in progress in the studio later on in his life. There was almost a sense of not wanting to finish the painting and the surface will build up more and more. Tell me about the sittings, as it were, for this work, because Freud famously would take months to do works. How many times would he have had to go into the stable and paint Sue? So he did take months and he was in the stable. He actually painted two of Sue and one of another horse, so he was consistently there for over a year and there would be weekly sittings. So it would be like any other subject. And I think what was really interesting, the first time he went to the stables and he met Sister Mary Joy, she didn't realise who Freud was and handed him over a book of how to paint and draw horses, <laughs> um, which was given back to her quite soon after. Can we detect art historical precedents in this? I mean, obviously, in terms of horses, we think Stubbs first of all, but was Lucian interested in that area of art history? Well, I remember actually my previous professional life started at Christie's, and one of the things that I used to do when I looked after... Lucian Freud in my capacity at Christie's was to show him works that were coming up and there was always an interest in looking at drawings of horses from the past. So definitely he was very aware and as you know famously he had a pass to the National Gallery where he could go at any time of the day or night uh, which he did very often to go and see the doctor when you need some help yeah. and yes he would have been very very aware. One of the things I'm struck by when I'm looking for art historical references is that I'm thinking more of, and this may seem a macabre reference, but I'm thinking more of things like Soutine and Rembrandt's side of beef than I am of Stubbs' horses who are so fastidiously rendered. So in a way, the art historical references may not actually be the, that, that kind of long equestrian history, if you know what I mean. Yes, but you also think of the Lacroix horses. You can think of so many different art historical sources. I agree with you. I think he was definitely soutine and his beef and his animals was something he was very fond of and very aware of. And I agree with you that, as with any artist that is very aware of what has happened before him, there's not just one or two sources. There are a combination of different sources plus what they bring to the table. So, yes, you can't clearly say, I can see this and that. And that's what also makes... Freud's such an incredible artist because what you can see is Lucien Freud. Right. And um, lastly, you've, you've included some photographs here, one particularly wonderful one. I, I presume they're by David Dawson, who David Dawson is a sort of maybe undersung hero of, of Freud's life because he was his, his studio assistant, but also was a really compelling photographer documenting Freud's life in the studio. And here you've got one rather wonderful of the mayor in the foreground. You've got, you've got Sue in the foreground, and in the background, you've got Lucian Freud there with a canvas, hard at work, deep in concentration. 
he's actually painting the painting we're talking about. So that's why I've included that photograph. I wanted really people to be able to see that when he painted animals, he treated animals like people. So the mayor is sitting for Lucien, like any other subject would have sat. And you see the easel set up next to the hay, and exactly what we're looking at is what we can see how he's viewing and how he's concentrating in the same way as he would have done with any other sitter. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, Pila. Thank you so much. Freud and Horses is at Ordovas until the 16th of December. As well as that and the National Gallery show, the other Freud exhibitions in London this autumn are Lucian Freud, the painter and his family at the Freud Museum until the 29th of January. Lucian Freud, BAT, a show of etchings at Lindsay Ingram until the 4th of November. Lucian Freud, Interior Life, with photographs by David Dawson, is at Hazlitt Holland Hibbert from the 6th of October until the 16th of December. Lucian Freud, Plant Portraits, is at the Garden Museum from the 14th of October until the 5th of March. And Friends and Relations, Lucian Freud, Francis Bacon, Frank Auerbach, Michael Andrews is at Gagosian Gallery from the 18th of November until the 28th of January. And that's it for this episode. We're on Twitter at Tan Audio and on Facebook and Instagram, of course. The Week in Art is produced by Amy Dawson, Henrietta Bentall and David Clack. And David also does the editing and sound design. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Daniel, Martin and Pilar. And thank you for listening. See you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.